Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mark Moriarty and I represent LKB Minerals Limited, the partner organisation for this webinar held in conjunction with the Institution of Civil Engineers. Today we're going to be talking about some of the engineering innovations and challenges around the Crossrail C610 project and more specifically around the supply of innovative heavyweight concrete for the installation of a floating truck slab. I'm pleased to say that we have the full project team represented in the room today, ready to talk about their role and experiences on the project. And it's my pleasure to introduce them now. We have Camilla Barrow, representing Vectec Limited and Crossrail, Michael Sutea of Arup, Corin O'Sullivan of ATC, Jack Sindhu of London Concrete, Andrew Turner of Camford Concrete Pumps, and Denise Roberts of LKB Minerals Limited. Before we start today's presentation, <clears throat> I'd like to mention the ICE's Knowledge Programme, which aims to support civil engineers and infrastructure professionals in their careers. ICE Knowledge Programme events, conferences, website content and webinars like this share the latest insight from industry, including technical innovation, project reports and lessons learned. The programme enables practitioners to develop their knowledge and expertise while also helping to tackle some of the big issues facing our industry. One date for your diary is the ICE Transport Asset Management Conference on the 21st of November, which has a stream dedicated to railways. Follow the link on your screen to find out more about this event. Today's webinar aims to provide a number of learning outcomes from challenges faced on the Crossrail C610 project, specifically regarding material selection for the floating track slab sections. You're able to submit your own questions during this presentation for a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. This is done by using the Q&A box on the right hand side of your screen. Ensure the Q&A window is fully expanded and type into the small window at the bottom of the screen. Click ask, choose all panellists and then press send. We'll be presenting for around 30 minutes today and we'll then open up for discussion. Finally, before we start today's presentation, it's relevant to highlight the importance placed on safety and associated management systems adopted by the companies represented here today. The systems are vital to delivering projects efficiently, safely and responsibly. So, without further ado, I'll hand over to Camilla Barrow for the first of today's presentations. So, good afternoon. My name's Camilla Barrow. I'm the Deputy Project Manager for the System-Wide Work on Crossrail. So, what I aim to do in the next couple of minutes is really just to give you an overview of what the Crossrail project is. So, what we're doing and what we've done. So the Crossrail project spans approximately 118 kilometres from Reading and Heathrow out in the west to Shenfield and Abbey Wood out in the east. It's currently the largest infrastructure project being undertaken in Europe. The project will add approximately 10% to central rail capacity within London and it also provide an extra 1.5 million people within 45 minutes of central London. So the project is approximately costing or has a funding envelope of about £14.8 billion. The entire alignment consists of 40 stations, of which 10 are brand new and 30 are just being improved and renovated. Um, it consists of approximately 42 kilometres of brand new rail tunnel systems, and that's all within central London. And it's had multiple people working on it, spanning the entire breadth of the 118 kilometres. Right now, the central operating system, so within central London, is due to open in December 2018. So the Crossrail System Wide Works was awarded to C610, that's the name of the package, and that's a joint venture between Alstom, TSO and Costain, so AT&C. So the System Wide Work is really looking, talking about track, anything that goes within the tunnel, so that's including the ventilation system, the overhead line, the M&E works and anything else that needs to be fitted out to make the trains operational and run end of next year. Um, so I've mentioned the track, so of the track types from the central operating system there's approximately five different types we've installed, majority being standard track slab, two being a, a, a variation of floating track slab. So I'm now going to show you a video which kind of sets the scene for what it's like down in the crossrail tunnels and what this floating track slab work consists of and how we installed it. We're currently standing 35 metres below ground uh, underneath the Barbican Theatre. We're standing on top of the floating track slab. So the floating track slab is used in two key locations. The first location is over in Soho, and the second location is directly beneath the Barbican Theatre, which is where we're standing at the moment. 
The construction of the FTS is very different than the majority of the track forms on the Elizabeth line. The floating track slab is primarily constructed using reinforcement. Uh, we then install spring housings, we then concrete. When the concrete has achieved sufficient strength, we then jack the concrete and it floats on, on springs and it dampens the noise of the trains as they pass over the top of it. So hopefully that set the scene for what the working environment was like during the installation and uh, I think it's a key milestone to note that last month we successfully installed all the track within the um, central operating system in London. I'm now going to hand you over to Michael who's going to talk a little bit about the design behind the floating track slab. All right, thanks Camilla. I am, uh, my name is Michael Sataya and I work in the uh, Arab office in Nottingham. I'll talk a little bit about uh, contract C122 which is the bore tunnel design and uh, the feasibility study that we did uh, with the heavyweight concrete uh, floating track slab uh, between November 2010 and March 2011. The C122 is, um, like I said, you know, a contract for the bore tunnel design uh, for approximately 42 kilometers of bore tunnel uh, under central London, uh, including interface with up to uh, eight new underground stations. Part of the route goes through the Barbican Theatre and also you know, through some uh, studios in, in and around Soho. Parliamentary undertakings placed quite a lot of stringent requirements on the amount of ground borne noise and vibration that you can transmit from the uh, trains moving underneath that. And in order to counter that, the uh, Arab Atkins joint venture, who were the designers on C122, proposed the floating track slab. I mean, I work in the Nottingham office, so we weren't, you know, we weren't central to the, uh, to the AAJV team, but uh, I'll explain to you our involvement as, uh, as I go along. The tunnel diameter could only be around uh, six meters, which meant that the floating track slab element could only be a certain size. There were spatial uh, restrictions on that. Now, in order for them to meet the frequency of oscillation that the uh, engineers on the AAJV had assumed, that had to have a sufficient suspended mass in order to, uh, to dampen the vibrations. You couldn't do that with normal weight concrete with a density of about 2.3 to 2.4 tons per cubic meter. Uh, you know, the option of putting metal ingots in there was uh, dismissed you know, quite early on because the floating track slab was already heavily reinforced and also there were issues around the uh, action with the surrounding concrete. There were also other issues around conductivity which you know, Corin and you know, who speaks subsequent to, to my involvement can, um, can, can also elaborate on a little bit, which then left heavyweight concrete as the only option and there are different choices of aggregates that we could have used, varieties, hematite and magnetite, which are ores of um, iron. Varieties tends to have a lot of chemical impurities, you know, including lead, so we dismiss that. Hematite, you know, availability, it's quite scarce in the UK, so again, we dismiss, dismiss that. Mag which left magnetite as really the only sort of feasible option for this work. Now, the need for the trial arose out of the fact that um, this is a fairly novel application for heavyweight concrete. Normally, it's used in, uh, for purposes of radiation shielding in uh, hospitals or power plants, uh, and also as counterweights in, uh, you know, for cranes or also in uh, marine uh, applications. Now, when the AJV were exploring uh, magnetized or heavyweight concrete as an option. Uh, they identified problems with batching, problems with transporting, uh, problems of segregation, uh, and also, like I mentioned, the uh, floating track slab is quite heavily reinforced. So again, you know, they, they had concerns about difficulties of compacting the concrete through the dense reinforcement. So because of all of this, they felt they needed, you know, a um, a trial to see, you know, just to see how feasible this uh, this material was. And at that time, this is going back to 2010 the method of construction that they had assumed was going to be pumping the concrete potentially up to about you know 500 meters now the density they had assumed for the floating track slab was 3000 kgs with that profile that you can see in your slide with the um, central bit central upstand which has been highlighted in red but if you could get the density up to about 3300 kgs you could then remove that central upstand which makes it you know a little bit easier to maintain so at this point, this is where we were starting to, uh, to get involved now. This is how, when they approached our team in the, uh, in the Nottingham office. Now, we said, okay, fine, if you're looking for 3,300 as your dry density, then you know, we, we started to define you know, the uh, requirements for the testing. So we said, okay, fine, we'll target a density of about 3,400 kgs per cubic meter, you know, assuming you lose maybe up to about 100 kgs in water. 
when they wrote the initial brief, um, the specification for the concrete was a C2835, and uh, when we established that, actually, the 35 MPA they were looking for was to allow them to jack it up, but then to jack it up, they were going to jack it up at seven days. Then we said, okay, fine, maybe we need to alter that specification a little bit to say that 35 MPA needs to be achieved at seven days rather than, than 28 days. Again, as I mentioned, this was quite early on, uh, way before this thing was going to be built. So we weren't sure who the contractor was going to be. We weren't sure who the ready mix supplier was going to be. We weren't sure where the batching plant was going to be. We weren't sure where the access points were going to be. So we had to make sure that the concrete had sufficient open time. So we specified a workability retention of four hours, which is you know, reasonably unusual. Um, and also issues of segregation, we, we specified a limit of about 10%. To make the material a little bit more sustainable, we said, look, you know, if you could try and get as much PFA in there to reduce the amount of virgin material in your, uh, in your cement. So we initially specified 25% of PFA, and then that was later taken on to about 30% as we, as we went ahead. So the aim of the trial was to see if we could pump the concrete up to about 500 meters into mock-up sections. Um, now, we did the initial laboratory trials and uh, we, we, we looked at different combinations of aggregates and different combinations of admixtures. Um, some of the mixes had just coarse aggregate was magnetite and then the uh, fine aggregate was made of normal weight sand and others had a blended uh, fines content which is you know normal weight sand and uh, magnetite fines and we found that the magnetite, the blended fines gave the best resistance to, to segregation so we went with a blended mix, if you if you want to call it that, uh, the mix also had you know a combination of you know plasticizing as well as super plasticizing admixes to give it that workability. But also the some of these admixes also had retarding properties to give it that workability retention to get you up to to the four hours of open time. So a after we've done all those trials, we then you know had an attempt at uh, at a full scale pumping trial. And uh, we automatically started to, or well, initially started to see uh, some issues uh, early on, and that is the aggregates were stored in uh, open bins outside. It was quite cold. The conditions in the, you know, on the day of testing were very different to what they were in the lab. So that, again, the behavior of the admixes was very different. The aggregates get kept on getting stuck to the uh, aggregate bins. So again, you know, so these were some of the issues that we were finding out early on. By the time we got to the quarry in Broxburn to conduct the full scale trials, we had other issues there, such as you know leakage of the pipe joints, as you can see in your slide, and then that led to blockages in the pipes. So we had to you know come back and do it again. We made a few modifications to the uh, mix as well as the uh, priming grout. There were still one or two other issues. I mean you know including debris you know being stuck from previous operations. So again, you know, we had to then have a, another go, and at this time, that's when uh, Comfort uh, got involved, uh, brought in a more powerful pump. You know, the uh, pipes were a little bit more uh, securely sealed. Again, you can't see any leakage in that, in that photo. So this one was a qualified success in that we were able to prove the feasibility of actually pumping the material of 500 meters into mock-up sections and compacting it, but uh, the material, uh, the concrete started to set quite quickly after we got to that uh, four-hour period. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, we started to make other recommendations going forward to say, okay, fine, yes, we have demonstrated you can pump this material 500 meters, but could you start looking at other things such as, you know, potentially coming up with an admixture combination, which means that your uh, loss of workability is more gradual. Also, by the time you've dis uh, determined who the suppliers are going to be, where your access points are going to be, do you still need that four hour retention period? And I'm sure, you know, my colleagues Cor Cor uh, Corinne and Jack uh, will, will speak about the evolution of the, uh, of the project uh, after me. And there were also other things that we, we wanted them to, to make sure they were quite clear on in that our mock-up sections were only about a meter to two meters long. This thing was designed to be poured in sections of up to 30 meters. So again, you know, there the are differences in there. Um, uh, differences also in simply the volume of the material that you're, you're, um, you're looking to batch. So all of these were recommendations that we put in a report to, to the AAJV, which they then took up to, uh, to Crossrail. And I think uh, Corin will speak about the, how everything evolved from these initial feasibility trials. So thank you very much, Corin. Good afternoon. I'm Corin O'Sullivan, uh, Procurement and Supply Package Manager for the Floating Trucks Lab for ATCJV. Um, in the initial, our initial uh, proposals was to set up a batching plant at Westbourne Park or Old Oak Common. Uh, and the, our 
initially we were looking at material that was costing approximately a thousand pounds per per cubic meter. Uh, our, our proposal was to um, to deliver the material by either pumps or by either using uh, concrete shuttles to the point of placement. Um, from the original trials and from the original plans that we set out with, we were looking at um, looking at dealing of up to about 500 meters of, of, of delivery by pump. Um, but what we also found was that actually you're dealing with a material that's 3.5 tons wet, and putting that material down 35 meters down a shaft and up to 500 meters along a tunnel also had its own problems. Um, so when we looked at the original um, the original procurement, um, we were looking at uh, the main companies to have management structures, structures and capacity with main plants and backup plants on site, um, having the existing materials uh, located nearby with proper storage bins, um, having a supply chain that can deliver to the centre of London, have, having people who have manufactured and ha have uh, experience of transporting uh, magnetite concrete uh, to the point of placement. So money became a secondary scope and it was really a risk reduction matrix we had to set up to ensure that we had a right first time uh, uh, philosophy. Um, the original tenders were issued in January um, of 2016 uh, with a return date of February but at this stage we started talking with all the manufacturers and the logistics and all of the issues that were arising it became very very quickly evident that a, ma a batching plant on site was not going to be feasible. Um, the, in addition, uh, through program and, and project constraints, um, we had then different issues of actually placing the material to the point of location to meet the, the critical program. And so ATC uh, joined with Crossrail to identify an alternative means of delivering the heavyweight concrete to the permanent point of placement. Um, we noticed that there were several areas in the centre of London where other contractors, Crossrail contractors, were working, and they could facilitate us putting um, putting a, a, um, a pump stations in each of these areas. However, these deliver new constraints, uh, which ended up having to have uh, the heavyweight concrete being pumped for up to a kilometre, which has never ever been done before, and equally pumping normal weight concrete for up to 1.3 uh, kilometres through the tunnels. In addition, uh, we needed the concrete now to last five to six hours instead of the original uh, four hours. Uh, and we also had to deal with a main plant and having to deal with the uh, the traffic congestion of London and dealing with all the parameters that brought. So we entered into a revised tender process with all the original tender applicants to try and meet the constraints in the programme. Uh, in the end, we ATC preferred prior, uh, supplier was London Concrete. Uh, eventually, and that came to December in 2015 after many trials and many, many um, variations of different mixes. We ended up with a fully uh, technically, cl technically compliant uh, design mix which matched all of the criteria which we needed. Uh, London Concrete had proposed a uh, main batching plant for us in the Battersea area with a backup plant right adjacent uh, and al also having all the materials and all the expertise stored at their main plant right adjacent to that as well. Um, a direct route site was proposed with having up to uh, seven to eight trucks and also having additional backup trucks on site just to, to overcome any difficulties we may, may have. We also had the security having the main backup plant adjacent, so we had all, the, all of the regular servicing, the maintenance uh, and the experience of that. Um, in addition, um, London Concrete came fully compliant with all of the quality regimes, uh, the health and safety standards, environmental standards, uh, sustainability for disposing of uh, excess material uh, and all of the um, cross rail project policies. Um, we agreed into a, um, a delivery program to meet uh, the ATC construction requirements uh, and equally w using the risk registers uh, proposed it became the most economical solution with, le with least risk potential. Um, all of the tender suppliers at the time uh, proposed to use the uh, magnetite from LKAB materials and we successfully ended up pumping the concrete 980 metres I believe um, to make the project uh, a success. Jack? you believe you developed that on? Yes, thank you very much, Corin. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Jack Sindhu, I'm the Technical Manager for London Concrete. I'll just go through the evolution process of the mixed design and uh, what we as London Concrete uh, achieved by supplying the magnetite concrete. So if I move on to the first slide for developing the concrete, uh, early engagement was required. We were involved uh, literally from the, the, the day the tender went out for the bid process. 
mixed design evolved in conjunction with David Grellick from ATC, the ATS track manager, uh, which had required numerous mixed designs from uh, the Arab's original mixed design, which was basically a slump concrete. We had to develop a flowing concrete. The criteria was set at 500 metres minimum pumping distance. Uh, eventually that became sort of uh, nearly a kilometre. So we had to provide a mixed design that met 35 newtons uh, seven days criteria. Uh, there was also a strength requirement of 10 newtons at um, 12 hours. Uh, and also the concrete density, uh, minimum of 3,300 kilograms per cubic metre. We designed a concrete mix uh, in the order of 3,600 kilograms per cubic metre, uh, which was based uh, on three magnetite, magnetense materials, 20S, 8S and 2S, in conjunction with a, um, a marine sand, which we then blended together with PFA and cement and a PCE admixture to give us the required mix for the project. We did roughly in the order of 100 um, laboratory trials and uh, numerous plant trials to achieve the, the final mix design, which we then uh, pumped through. The trial mixes originally lab trials, as we mentioned earlier on. We then did a, uh, a pumping trial at Old Oak Common, uh, where a concrete pump was set up by Canfords and we did three separate pumping distances. We started off with 130 metres, 500 metres and roughly 630 metres where the concrete was pumped from the pump in a five inch uh, pump line uh, and the concrete was very, very good. Pumped, no blockages um, and everybody was happy. So if we move on. In order for the concrete to pump, uh, we, we found that we had to develop a grout mix which would uh, initially comprise of PFA and cement. The initial problems we had was there was a very, very sh uh, short supply of PFA in the marketplace when the contract eventually came live. So we decided to actually stockpile the PFA around some of our plants in London, which we then utilised and, and bought into the batching plant at Battersea for the contract. The grout mix originally was PFA and cement, as I mentioned earlier on. Uh, we had to change that mix to a uh, cement and a limestone filler based mix which we then su supplied successfully for the pumping operation which was critical for the guys to actually pump these sort of distances. The pump had to be grouted correctly. We had stringent batching procedures in place at the batching plant to ensure the concrete was batched correctly within the required tolerances and gave the required uh, performance for the, for the contract. One of the requirements for the batching processes was that the concrete was actually tested on site. It was also tested at the batching plant prior to dispatch. And if it wasn't correct, the concrete wasn't dispatched. Every load that was batched uh, came with a, uh, an autographic record that was supplied with the load, which was then sent onto site for compliance check-in prior to acceptance. What we did as a, a company, London Concrete, actually invested in a brand new concrete plant for this uh, project, uh, which enabled us to batch these three separate materials, which gave us a really good viscous uh, rheology of the concrete was very good and the mix was uh, not prone to any segregation. The combined aggregate grading we got was very, very good with the 20S, the 8S and the 2S and the marine sand. And with the PFA, it gave us a very, very good concrete um, and it was very, very good to batch, easy to batch in the end and um, compliance wise we had a few loads rejected on the contract which we would have expected for flow but apart from that the contract went very, very well, very happy with the concrete. We, as earlier on uh, Corin mentioned, we, we achieved a concrete pumping distance of around 980 metres, that as far as I'm aware is a world record for heavyweight concrete. Uh, the nearest uh, distance is somewhere around about 500 metres has been pumped before. So with this sort of robust mix design, we felt we could have probably pumped a bit further. But what Andrew from Camford Pumps will probably go through that a bit later on. And the batching cycle of the concrete, we ended up with such a finite batching sequence that we could actually batch a four and a half metre load in, in roughly 10 to 12 minutes. The batching cycle was the mixer we had was a three metre mixer. Uh, a twin shaft mixer. We were batching in three batches, so that's three one and a half metre batches in 10 to 12 minutes. And we were restricted due to the density of the concrete, we could only carry four and a half metres of concrete in the, in the truck at one time. 
And in the contract, eventually we supplied uh, roughly in the order of 4,000 metres of uh, heavyweight magda dense concrete successfully to three different locations for the Crossrail project. I'll just pass you on to um, Andrew from Camford Pumps, so you can take over. Good afternoon, I'm Andrew Turner from Camford Concrete Pumps. Our job was to move the concrete from uh, the surface down to the floating track slab. Um, we did that from three different pumping stations. Um, each one we had about 35 meter depth of shaft and then up to 1,000 meters of pipeline into the tunnel. Whenever we look at, uh, whenever we look at these jobs, um, we say that there are three things that we need for success. We need good concrete, we need strong pumps and we need experienced operators. Shan't go too much into the concrete, Jack's just gone through that for you, but I'd just like to reiterate from our point of view, we were very, very happy with the concrete. Um, uh, London Concrete delivered a very cohesive mix, a fluid mix. It held together well, even under pressure. And we were a little concerned that we might have the heavyweight material dropping out if we had any uh, stoppages in pumping for whatever reason um, and we experienced none of that mm. at all. So I think thanks to London Concrete, the material supplier LAK, LKAV um, and Creso who supplied the admixture which held the material together, I think we came up with a very good solution for this. So uh, the next thing that we need, obviously we need powerful concrete pumps. When we were pumping a thousand metres of pipeline, we had about 12 and a half cubic metres of concrete in that line. And that equates to 44 tonnes of material. So that means that at the furthest distance, every stroke of the concrete pump, we were pushing 44 tonnes. So for this contract, we purchased brand new pumps, brand new static pumps. We used uh, Putzmeister static pumps. The main one that we used for the pumping was the BSA 2110. These we chose uh, based on our original work with Arabs for the original trials um, at Broxbourne and also the three trials that we did with ATC. Um, and then we factored in the anticipated pumping pressures, uh, the length of the pipeline and the speed at which ATC required us to place the concrete. And finally, um, key and often unthought of un unsung heroes in this uh, a project are our pump operators. We had a permanent team down there. Um, uh, some of the team had over 20 years experience pumping concrete. The two fellas that you can see in the picture there, they have 35 years of experience pumping concrete between them. And so we're all sitting here telling you what a successful operation we've had, what a successful project it's been. But of course, as well as the success, we needed to ensure safety as well. And there were one or two things we put into our pumping system to ensure that safety. The first thing was the high pressure pipeline. We used a 125 millimeter high pressure pipeline, which has a safe working pressure of 130 bar. Um, earlier in the presentation, you saw some pipeline where there was a lot of leakage and some problems with um, segregation of blockages because of the leakage from the couplings. We chose this system with a male-female flanges and coupling system specifically to avoid that problem and obviously to withstand the pressure because we were pumping much further and much faster. The other thing that we did to ensure the safety, especially when you consider we're working in an enclosed environment in the tunnel, this was obviously at the forefront of our minds, um, we secured the pipeline all the way along to the, to from the pump to the pour and we secured it in uh, thrust blocks as you can see in the back of this slide that's at the bottom of this shaft. Um, on the right you can see a couple of brackets we have brackets securing the pipe all the way down the line and then the big item that you can see central to that picture is a hydraulic shut off valve which we shut every time we stop pumping um, and then when we finish the pour just before we washed out the pump. That's to isolate the pump from the pipeline and to make sure that we can relieve pressure if we needed to break the pipeline for whatever reason. And then finally, at the very end of our operation each night, um, we used a water washout system 
to clean the pipeline. Bearing in mind there was about 12 and a half cubic metres um, in the pipe, obviously we didn't want to waste that for economic reasons and for environmental reasons. So what we did was we pushed all of that concrete out by pumping water and we separated the water and the concrete uh, with a series of uh, sponge balls and pigs. And the reason we had to make that separation was otherwise the water would wash the aggregate out of the concrete and we would have a blockage. Um, and so we pushed out the material into the pour and when they'd finished the last piece of concrete we pushed into the hopper which you can see in that photograph um, and we normally ended up with, let's say, uh, one metre wasted at the end of the pour, no more than that. And then the water that was contained in the pipeline, we blew back using compressed air, and we blew it back into a holding hopper, and then it were a holding tank, I mean, and there it was cleaned, and then it was reused for the next pour. Um, and we did that water washout for each of the 70 pours that we did with the heavyweight concrete. And then my final slide is just uh, was taken on the last pour at Farringdon. This is the final pour. And that's just to illustrate the teamwork that we had there. Um, and it was in part this teamwork, everybody coming together, Crossrail, ATC, London Concrete, um, LKAB and Camford Concrete Pumps to ensure that we uh, worked cooperatively and we had a safe system of pumping. Could you just hand over to De Denise now from LKAB. Thank you, Andrew. Um, my name's Denise Roberts. I'm uh, here to represent LKAB Minerals. The LKAB Group is a Swedish state-owned company headquartered in Luleå and a leading producer of upgraded iron ore pellets predominantly for the steelworks. LKB Minerals were established to develop alternative applications and uh, the heavy concrete is one of those such applications. LKB in 2016 had a 1.72 billion euro turnover. We have uh, over 4,000 employees and we're producing close to 30 million tonne of iron ore per year. We operate underground and open pit mines in the northern part of Sweden above the Arctic Circle. Our own ore railways generate power in the downhill gradient, which is then fed back to the grid. Each batch of material is tested for EN12620 prior to dispatch to strategic stockpiles around the globe and also to our customers. Magnadense the mineral is an iron oxide Fe304. It's chemically inert and pH neutral. It has a very low water absorption and most hardness of 5.5. I mention those two properties in particular because they're very important when looking at concrete as they control strength and uh, co uh, consistent density. The standard sizes that we produce are 20 to 4, 0 to 8 and 0 to 2 millimetres. Magnadense in concrete can achieve up to 4.1 tonnes per cubic metre depending on the type of concrete that you're looking for, and it can be some 60% heavier than standard concrete. We can achieve equivalent strengths to standard concrete, if not better at times. The pump and distances that have been achieved, as you've heard today, is up to 1,000 metres horizontally, with a very high workable flowing concrete. We have uh, had projects that have used self-compacting concrete, and um, with the very uh, good thermal properties of the product and the low coefficient of thermal expansion, we have uh, very uh, low peak temperatures which can reduce the risk of thermal cracking. Within this uh, project of Crossrail, in another part of the tunnel, magnadense was used to negate hydrostatic pressure. But you can find out more about that project on our website. Well, thank you for listening and uh, I'm going to hand back now to Mark Moriarty. Thank you very much, Denise, <coughs> and to our other speakers today, Camilla, Michael, Corin, Jack and Andrew, for some very excellent and really interesting presentations. Okay, we're now going to have the Q&A session. <coughs> we have approximately <coughs> 20 minutes or so for that. <coughs> so you can submit your questions now using the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. Remember to ensure the Q&A window is fully expanded and type into the small window at the bottom of the screen. 
click ask, choose all panellists and then press send. Okay, I have a, a question actually just to get the ball rolling. Um, is anyone able to tell me what the main differences um, are between a standard concrete and a heavy concrete for batching and, and general sort of handling? Well, obviously, normal concrete we batch um, day in, day out, so that uses normal weight aggregates, uh, giving you a density somewhere between 2,300 and 2,400 kilograms per cubic metre. The material is relatively easy to handle. The plants are designed uh, to handle that sort of material. When we start using heavy weight aggregates, we had to make uh, modifications to our batching plant, even though it was a new batching plant. We had to strengthen the belts. Uh, the material, particularly the, the 8S, the 2S, it can become quite claggy, so we had to uh, make modifications to the batching plant with vibrators, waffle boards, etc., to make the material flow. Uh, at times, the material will clump, uh, and part of the derivation trials we've done was um, to allow for the overweight of material because of the clagginess, uh, it would just fall out of the bottom of the bin in a big lump. Um, but yeah, they are difficult to handle for normal uh, materials. And obviously, to get that density, you need these metal type materials to get the uh, required density for the project. Okay, good. Okay, so we have a, a few questions from uh, some of the um, people that have joined the webinar today. Uh, I have a question here from a Michael Baxter. Uh, again, I'll open this up to all the panellists. Uh, Michael Baxter is from Track International Hong Kong. Um, why was the diameter of the 6.2 metre tunnel not increased to accommodate the floating track slab to avoid the need for high density concrete? <coughs> um, it says here the need to tunnel near the Barbican was known long before the tunnels were constructed. Would anybody mm -hmm. like to, to pick that up? Well, I mean, I wasn't part of the AAJV itself, but uh, I presume it's, you know, it's just to do with the fact, you know, you're, you're in the middle of London, you've got buildings around you, and you know, and uh, you know th those kind of issues that you need to you need to take into consideration when you're when you're coming up to um, to what diameter of, of tunnel or tunnel you need to uh, y you can use how much space you've got to uh, to use that. I mean, I, I'm not you know I'm, I can find out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I suppose. I, th I think that's correct. The existing utilities all around the tunnels, uh, utilities, infrastructure, other infrastructure, so the underground systems, we were really restricted mm -hmm. in that. So we had really very limited flexibility in terms of the diameter. Okay, so I, I guess also if you're able to stick to the same design of floating track slab without too many major modifications, that's got to be a, a cost benefit and a, a, a construction project time benefit as well, I would imagine. Certainly something that was considered, yeah. <coughs> okay, we have uh, another question from Alan Nam uh, to all presenters. This is a very useful CPD. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, thank you for your time and sharing the valuable information. A quick question. <coughs> In fact, he's got a few questions here. Um, we would like to know any particular difficulties during construction of this project. Does anyone would like to take that first part up? I think I can, I can obviously answer the concrete mix design. Uh, the evolution process was quite lengthy uh, and even during construction uh, the mix design had to be modified a couple of times to accommodate the, the distance of pumping. So the mix design was evolved. We had two or three separate mix designs based on flow uh, dependent on the distance of pumping. But generally speaking, once the original mix design was done, um, it could be replicated quite easily. The materials were very consistent and we could achieve the desired flow and, and workability for Andrew and his team to pump it. And the guys uh, ATC uh, who were placing the concrete found the concrete very uh, usable and they could get all the, the levels and the cans quite good with the mix design that, that we supplied. Uh, unless I anybody else wants to... Sort just an addition, yeah, Jack, I'd like yeah. to add that um, w in our, our risk analysis when we did it, we took uh, things like uh, traffic congestion, we put, did all our concrete pours by night, yes. we worked in the area of the Smithfield market, we worked with all the, the local residents, the Smithfield traders, we accommodated their, their working areas and we worked very, very well with, with the, different, uh, the different parties in London uh, of where we were working. Um, things happen like trucks get stuck in, in traffic, trucks get rejected, and I think we addition we, we placed additional trucks on standby yep. and we overcame all those potential potential problems um, by foreseeing them from the experience we were having on the nightly on the nightly reports. Uh, I think as Corin said, uh, planning was critical uh, for every pour basically because we had to make sure we had the right number of trucks. The consistency was correct at the batching plant when we batched the material 
the guys were trained up to actually batch the material, the batching processes and procedures were followed, and uh, part of the project involved that we obviously supplied the grout first to grout the pump, then we had to make sure we had enough concrete on site for them to start pumping and make sure we didn't have anything that was rejected. So the first two or three loads were very critical to the start of every ball. Uh, I'd just like to add a little bit of something there. Um, from a supplier point of view of the aggregate, we did import all of the material that was needed for the project into our store right before the project started, so it was all there and available. We also worked with London Concrete to hold some stocks close to where the material would be needed in case we had breakdowns in transport. So there was a lot of planning gone in from the early stage with the aggregate itself. Okay, <coughs> uh, Alan also asked a second question um, about high groundwater level. Um, I guess he's talking about the water table there. Uh, did that need to be closely monitored? Was there any benefit to using um, high density concrete for that on the 610 project? Not necessarily in that particular project, but we did supply a different part of the tunnel um, with uh, magnadense concrete that was uh, placed in a slip form type concrete uh, for that purpose, for hydrostatic pressure. Okay. We now have a question from uh, Kerry Akos. Uh, please could you elaborate more on the floating slab and its advantages? Do you like to take that one? Two designs. <laughs> <laughs> to go through. Yeah, I think... I think uh, the, the very the, the principle of it is that you know instead of casting your uh, track slab against the the tunnel wall the tunnel lining and then have trains run over that and then with all the vibration and uh, all the noise that that causes this particular floating track slab was then suspended off the springs and then that allows if you have that element essentially separated from from the tunnel lining and if you give it sufficient uh, mass to, so that you've got a certain frequency of oscillation then that allows you to then reduce how much vibrations you're then transmitting to whatever it is you've got uh, you know, uh, above you. So you know, in the case of the Barbican Theatre, for example, or in the case of um, some of the uh, studios in and around Soho, or, or I have to point out that the studios in and around Soho also had a floating track slab, albeit a slightly different one to the one that we've, okay. we've presented in here. At the time that we did the, uh, these initial trials, most of the work that we were looking at was you know, centered around the design of the floating track slab in and around the Barbican Theatre. Okay. We have a, a similar question from a Baptiste. Um, how much vibration decrease is expected? So I guess there was a target to achieve. Uh, there was a limit of about 7 hertz natural frequency. That was, you know, part of the parliamentary undertakings. So I think the guys, when the guys on the AAJV team did that uh, initial calculations, they figured that if you give this thing with its size a density of about 3,000 to 3,300 uh, kgs per cubic meter, then that gives you that uh, frequency of oscillation. Okay. <coughs> a question from um, Sujay. Very interesting to learn about this project, and cr congratulations to the Crossrail team. Uh, just wondering if any local level difference in horizontal pumping would affect the consistency of the material. So I, I think he's asking about the distance. Was there any effect on rheology from uh, initial pumping? To I think, as um, I said earlier on, the, the, the concrete mix design that evolved uh, since 2010, uh, when we actually uh, started to supply the concrete in 2016, the, the admixture technology had moved on somewhat as well. We were able to achieve a very viscous, uh, very um, cohesive concrete with very little segregation. Um, as long as the concrete flow was correct at point of batching and when it arrived on site, uh, I think the concrete, uh, when we pumped it 980 metres, it would come out the other end reasonable uh, enough to pump and also to place and finish. I think Andrew might comment on that, what the, what the concrete was like at the other end of the Yeah, time. well, I think that that was everybody's concern yeah. uh, from the outset, when we started the trials off, and then when we had the trials with um, ATC. Um, and, you know, we were a little bit sceptical, but, you know, we were working with uh, uh, the material manufacturers, we were working with the ready-mix suppliers, we were working um, uh, with the uh, admixture suppliers, um, and everybody seemed confident that they could produce a material where the heavy weight, the dense material, would not drop out. It would stay in suspension. Um, and to be fair, that was our experience the whole of the way through. I mean, you know, any project like that, we were involved, um, the actual pouring of the concrete, 15 months. Um, and any project of that length, you're always going to come across some issues. 
um, the secrets, how you resolve them and how quickly you resolve them. But certainly that wasn't ever one of the issues. We never had an issue with a heavy ma heavyweight material dropping out of the material, out of the concrete. Well, might, I, might I also add to that, that yeah. it, as the project evolved and we were getting longer and longer distances, um, we as ATC took a decision to reduce the specification, to reduce the tolerances that we yeah. could achieve. And even though trucks were arriving, we would reject them on the basis of that we felt we needed tighter constraints and we took those decisions to make the project, uh, to make each slab successful. Um, I think that was kind of key of realising what problems were, it was, what, think, what we needed to do. I think the, the batching control, as I mentioned earlier on, the batching control both uh, at our site and also the, the acceptance on site was critical in communication and obviously teamwork uh, within Camford, um, ATC and London Concrete, it was critical to make the, the, the project work. Yeah. And if we didn't get the communication, uh, it wouldn't have worked properly. One of the areas where we um, uh, mm -hmm. had concerns <laughs> about the material <laughs> dropping out of the concrete was at the bottom of the shaft. And in the slide, in, in, in my small part of the presentation, you saw that um, hydraulic gate valve there. And the purpose, one of the purposes of that was to hold the concrete back so that that a vertical pipeline, the 35 metres in the shaft, was always full of concrete. So as soon as we stopped pumping, for whatever reason, the gate valve got shut. And then when we started, we opened the gate valve and then the pump came on again. And that was a concern of ours, particularly in, that, um, in, the, in the vertical stack in the shaft. We never had a problem, the whole contract. Well, I think the other benefit was the service had to be right. As I mentioned earlier on, uh, when we started the, the, the pause, the, the grout was first and then three loads of concrete to follow but the service throughout the pause had to be very very good we tried to avoid or minimize uh, the gaps between loads as much as we could uh, and the rheology of the concrete coming back to the, the open life was very good uh, as Corin mentioned earlier on uh, we managed to achieve five to six hours open life which was uh, very um, challenging for this sort of concrete it's not a normal concrete it's heavyweight concrete it's not easy to do um, yeah, I, I was just going to add to the fact that obviously when you know when you're giving a presentation like this and you know you're, what you're seeing is a summary, sometimes it's just a little bit difficult to appreciate just a lot of the background work that goes into it. I mean, on our trials when we were doing the lab trials, we looked at you know loads and loads of mixes. I mean, you must have been maybe forty, if not fifty, types of mixes where you're trying to get the grading right. Yeah, I appreciate in the end the mix that you know London Concrete used was slightly different to. Yeah to the one that we use, but again, they, they would have had to go through a similar process where you're trying to um, change the content of the fine aggregate that's made of magnetite and that which is made of sand. You're trying to do all sorts of experiments with the, um, the admixture or admixture combinations that you're trying to, trying yes, to do. You're doing, various, mm -hmm. you're doing various segregation tests where yep. you cast either cylinders or you take uh, cores and you slice them up. And you know, you're trying to do all of this work just to make sure that by the time you actually get to batching, you're quite happy with the product that you do have, and uh, that to alleviate some of the uh, some of the issues that uh, some of our some of the audience have, uh, have highlighted. I think it does. The early engagement, the earlier we got involved, the the better it was to join forces together with Camford ATC to come up with a product that would work. Definitely, and obviously with MKAB. Yeah. yeah, I mean, just from our part, we do uh, work with a lot of the concrete companies and. Um, with samples and uh, suggestions on mixed designs and, and that kind of thing. There's a lot of support that comes from LKB Minerals in the lead up to any of this work. Um, obviously, uh, the technical side comes from people like uh, Jack and, um, and the guys here, um, but we are there to support the development of any of these mixed designs. Okay, <coughs> another question from a Janani. Uh, thank you all uh, for the Thank you to all the presenters for their time. <coughs> Very useful, beneficial presentation. Question is, what are the health and safety measures taken for the operators working with heavyweight concrete? I think in the initial, when we bought the pipeline, one thing that is evident, normal pipeline that we would use is three meter long lengths of pipe. Uh, we reduced the lengths of pipes down to two meters because of the added weight. We had brackets in every single pipe. We had a full um, team design, designing the pipeline, designing the truss blocks. That got independently CAT3 uh, certified prior to any loading or any use. Uh, the operatives then, um, whenever there was a blockage in the pipeline, Camforts had a specialist crew, but we also had our team of men there to assist everybody to the pump. Engineers, everybody got on board to clear that blockage, get the pipeline back ready and make it um, back safe for use. 
I think at the workforce, uh, at the very face, we had, um, there was no areas that you could stand in front of the pipeline, in front of the delivery pipeline. Everybody was behind that pipeline. And the delivery hose um, was controlled just by, um, by a matter of three or four men managing that pipeline. We could shut off the valves at any stage to reduce the pressure. And there was a communication constantly from the delivery pipeline back to the pump feed relating what pressures were going on and what was happening in the tunnel. So the was there time. more of a concern pumping heavy concrete compared to? Yes, mm. yes, the weight, the weight of the pipeline significantly. To lift one of the pipes, you're looking at a, a material that's 60% heavier. Mm. Um, there has to be the health and safety and, and the training done to be able to manage a, a blockage. And that's where Camford's expertise came in to, 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 uh, to assist us with that and to give us the training and, and to be there for us. OK, good. I think we've got time for maybe a couple more. Um, <coughs> question from Chris Pollock. What measures were taken at the joint between the floating track slab and the conventional slab to accommodate differential movement of the rails and the axle loading? Good question. Can anybody pick that up? It's possible. I should mention actually, if, th if there's anything um, or any additional questions, then please send them in, and somebody will get back to you at some point after the presentation today. Might I just add on that one? When you do enter onto the FTS light, there's transition bearings. We have additional bearings to make the slab stiffer as you enter on, uh, hence preventing the movement of the rails. And equally, for the FTS Barbican, there's an additional six springs to make the actual transition slab stiffer, just to take you from the traditional SDS. Uh, and on the FTS light, we went from a section of um, uh, um, supported on um, rubber bearings and having um, lateral restraints and braking blocks to then going into a series of has sleepers to take us back to the, to reduce down the dampening force again, to take us back into the traditional STS slabs. So that there has been, the slabs are different as you travel yeah. along them, but they different, differ, there's different stiffnesses in them to accommodate that. And that's mainly to meet uh, noise and vibration. Yes, and the transition from the STS slab onto the, onto the floating track slab. Okay. <coughs> well, I think that concludes our uh, um, Q&A session for today. Uh, again, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to submit those and somebody will get back to you at some point after the presentation today. So <clears throat> thanks again to our speakers today, Camilla Barrow for her overview on the system-wide main works on the Crossrail project, Alex Michael Satara for his presentation on the floating track slab design and decision to use magnodense heavy concrete to meet the noise and vibration requirements, Coron O'Sullivan from ATC on the tender and procurement process used to source the heavyweight concrete, Jack Sindhu from London Concrete for his presentation on the development of the concrete mix design and batching process, and finally to Denise Roberts <coughs> from LKB Minerals Limited for a presentation on the properties and applications of Magdadents. Slides from today's webinar will be circulated to attendees and a recording made available on the IC website in the next few days. Remember to look out for the Transport Asset Management Conference on the 21st of November. That concludes today's webinar. Thank you to all and goodbye. <coughs>